Hello, and welcome to Dickinson's Real Deal. On this show, I help members of the public to get the very best price for their antiques and valuables. We sit them down with one of our regular dealers. They're going to make a tempting cash offer on the table today. 200. Stop me if I go too far. No, I'm not stopping you, I'm not stopping you yet. <laughs> the alternative is simple place the same goods into a local auction, I will be on hand at all times to help and advise. Today the show comes to you from Clandidno in North Wales. There's a great crowd of people here. They brought along their treasures. They are determined to do business. You know why? They want to walk away with the real deal. It's all go in the busy dealer's den, and it's straight over to Simon Schneider, who has a sparkle in his eye. Wendy, you've bought in this pretty little pendant tum brooch. Yes. What can you tell me about this? All I know about it is that it's Victorian. Mm. Um, it belonged to my mother-in-law, and I inherited it when she passed away. Um, I think it's very pretty, but it's not the sort of thing I would wear. Not, you wouldn't wear it yourself anymore? No. Have you ever no, worn it? Or... I haven't, no. no. So no. it's just been laying in but the But she, she wore it quite a bit. Well, yeah. It's a pretty little pendant, and it's actually sort of got a double usage, this, hasn't yes, it? Yes, Because if we turn it over, we can have a look. It's also got a little got the pin, pin so yes. you can either wear it as a brooch or, a or you can wear it as a pendant. Yeah. So it's got sort of yeah. twice the uh, options of wearing it. Um, I believe it's 18 karat gold, and these are seed pearls. Yes. And it's actually sort of like a star, isn't it? It's a it very, is. very pretty little design, actually. And I'd agree, I would say this probably was made around 1880, 1890, something yes. like that, which yes. firmly dates it. Just have a look with the glass on it, and we can have a look at these stones. There's just one little... Tiny one missing. Tiny pearl yes, missing out, out of there, which wouldn't be difficult to replace, no. and, and doesn't really make much difference to the value of it. OK, well, I think it's a very pretty little brooch, come pendant, Wendy, and I would like to buy it. I'd like to make you an offer of 20, 40, 60, 80, 120 pounds. That's quite generous, isn't it? It's very difficult when you... to know the value. Um... Perhaps, Perhaps David let's, could let's give me a bit of opinion. advice. Well, I saw you were a little bit unsure, so let me try and advise. Very pretty brooch. Uh, small pearls and gold. 18 carat, I think, isn't it? It's not it? hallmark, but I think it is 18. Yeah. It looks it. Not the most fashionable thing at the moment, though I have to say, a very pretty little item. Now, the independent valuers and the auctioneer, they're both similar. One's 100 to 120, one's 100 to 150. I think Simon has already got 120 on the table. If you go to auction, there is a commission to yes. pay. My right. advice is that money is on the table, cash is king. It's a nice item. I'm sure Simon can sell it and have a small margin of profit. Right. For safety's sake, I'm going to say it's a good deal. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so that is really your top offer. Well, I've gone in strong with it because I didn't, you know, I could have started off with yes, a bit less and yes, built it up, yes. but I think it's a nice thing, and I think, you know, out of respect to your mother-in-law, it would be right. best to offer a decent price for it okay, straight then. off. I'm so. prepared to deal. You're prepared to deal. Thank I you very much do. for coming in, Wendy. Next, will John Parker score with this autograph picture? Well, we've got a photograph here of a footballer, obviously an accomplished footballer. Can you tell me who this chap Meredith was? Well, uh, he played for Chirk originally, mm -hmm. and then after Chirk he moved on to various other clubs, and then to Manchester City. Oh, and then right. from Manchester City he uh, went to Manchester United, where he scored no end of goals, and he was one of the mm. top scorers in Manchester Really? Oh, really? And after he went, uh, I think he went back to Chirk yeah. after... After and what period was this? What? Uh, well, he was born in um, 1884 or something like that, uh -huh. I think. And, and what's your connection? Well, with it's uh, my connection with it. It's just um, it belonged, it came through a family to, in a, a postcard album which belonged to my great grandmother. And as I was yeah. looking through it, I found this particular postcard and then I started searching the internet for it because he actually mm -hmm. lived down the road. Mm -hmm. So I, I take it that. He might have been known to my 
family through whatever means. I don't know, right, and that's yes. why they, uh, they've had a signed autograph of him. Mm. John, it's a really fascinating piece of football history. Football yes. isn't my subject, or I don't particularly go for football, but it, it is interesting, just for the historical point of view. I mean, you can see the really nice signature, which I think, I think the signature could well be genuine. John, I'm going to make you an offer. It's not a very good offer, because it's not my subject, no. and I'd have to be, you know, to make any greater offer, I'd have to be absolutely certain. But it is an offer, £10. Please don't, please don't be insulted. No, no. No, I'll take it to auction. Okay. I think it's worth a lot more than that. Yes, I hope you get that. All the very, very best. I, thank you very much. Hopefully, seller John will get a much better result with the bidders as the photograph goes under the gavel of auctioneer Simon Bauer. 60113. You brought along on the dealer's day a photographic postcard of the footballer William Henry Billy Meredith. And John said, I'll give you a tenner. What did you say to that? No, no way. I think no it's worth way. More than that. No way. No way, man. We are here at the sale room now. 30 to 40 is the estimate. It's coming up now. It's got a £30 reserve on it. Did John do the right thing by coming to auction? Of course he did. Bid to me to start at £25 and bid at 25 for the card of Billy Meredith at £25 and bid at £25, 8 28 bid, 30 30 32 They like it. Local man, a Welsh guy, well received here. £40, I'll it to 42 42 bid, 45 48 50 They like it, £50. 55 now. 58, 58 bid, 60, 60 bid, 60 bid. Another one, at 60 bid, 60 bid, 60 bid. Are we two again? Standing the bid then at 60 pounds and off mine. 60 pounds, take off 10% commission. That makes 54 pounds. What's your first thoughts on 54 quid? Boom, goal. Oh, I'm very pleased with that. Please? I'm glad it's going to somebody who appreciates it. OK. You're satisfied with the money? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. OK. £60. Lots of interest here in the sale room. Take away the commission. <laughs> and John's going home with 54 quid. That's the real <laughs> deal. And we've scored. Now it's back to the dealer's den to see if Stuart Hofgartner will pay pots of money for the next item. And uh, we can see you bought a jardinier for us. Right. And what can you tell us about it? Very little, in fact. I mean, I can remember it being in the loft as a child, right. in fact, and then it's been passed through other members of the family and it came to me when my elder brother died. Lovely looking jardinier. I mean, it's made by Raw Dalton. You probably know that already. Yes. Very famous factory for things of this nature. This is particularly interesting to me because of how the decoration is made. Right. They actually used real leaves yes. for the different patterns on here. So that was a real leaf pressed in there before it was finished and glazed. And they did probably six or eight different designs mm -hmm. of jardinaires like this, sometimes maple leaves, but it's just all different leaves. And they probably did, I think, three or four different sizes of each. So right. very popular. This one's probably about 1910, 1920. Couldn't find any damage on it, but that's a good sign. Good. And um, I'll have a go at buying it. So right. let's see how we get on. 20, 40, 60 pounds. Hmm. That's interesting, but... Uh... Interesting, but... But. So I heard the but, <laughs> and I'm fascinated to know what the but is. You're hoping for more, aren't you? I'm hoping for a little bit more, yes. OK, well, I'll tell you what the independent value is in the auctioneer, say, Stuart. That they're all in that 30 to 50, 50 to 60. And I think I agree with you. It's a name to conjure with, Dalton Lambeth, but in recent years, small jardinaires, aspidestra pots, whatever you want to call them, they're not as popular and they haven't been doing as well. But this particular design, the leaf design, I think is very good. Interior decoration, a nice plant in that. It's a nice commercial looking item. But will it do any better in the sale room? I'm going to say if it was me, I wouldn't gamble, 
I would take the £60 and I would say, Stuart, as always, good offer. Actually, I was just hoping to a little bit more, but uh, can I try it? <laughs> you can try it, but, but I think David sort of confirmed what I was thinking in, in one respect and £60 on the table. OK. OK, we have a deal? OK, a deal. Thank you very much. After the break, Punch and Judy comes to Dickinson's Real Deal. Don't you dare miss it. Welcome back to Dickinson's Real Deal, where a huge range of antiques and collectibles are being presented to our busy dealers. And now it's over to Corey Jeffrey and a man on a mission. What's the mission? To see how much we can get for the bracelet. So do you mind me asking whose the bracelet is? It's my wife's. And was there a reason to sell it? Well, we're looking to get some money to buy some uh, little pieces of Welsh gold for my two girls. And are you very Welsh? I'm not. I'm actually from the Midlands, but my wife is Welsh and both the girls are Welsh, so... They've mm. left you in charge of the jewellery? They have indeed. Mm. Totally all by yourself to make mm. the decision? With instructions. With instructions, right. Mm. What are the instructions? Get as much as you can for it. Oh, is that yeah, the yeah. instructions? <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Girls after my own heart, then. Well, let's have a look at it. Right. And it's a pretty little bracelet, little bangle. And I would say, yes, about 30 years old, 25 mm. to 30 years old. And I've seen a nine-carat mark on it, but it's mm. really tiny. There's a little, fairly modern nine-carat mark. And it's set with tiny, tiny little diamonds and little emeralds. Yes, yeah, pretty little bracelet. Because it's only 30 years old, mm -hmm. it's falling between two stools. It's not antique mm -hmm. and it's not new. Mm -hmm. So it's just a piece of second-hand jewellery as mm -hmm. such. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't help with saleability. Right. So, so you're really looking at breaking down what it's made of. Mm -hmm. So it's the gold content that's mm -hmm. going to dictate the value. Yeah. And as you know, at the moment, gold is very high. Mm -hmm. So it's a good time to sell it. Mm -hmm. Right, well, let's see if we can go home with a smile on your yeah. face or okay. off to auction. Right, let's okay. see what I can put on the table. 20. 40. 60. 80. Now, I'm very near what I would like to spend on that, mm -hmm. on that bracelet. Yeah. I don't know whether you feel that's going to be enough. No. I'm actually going to give you my final offer mm -hmm. of 100. There's right. 100 on the table. Mm -hmm. I've jumped in here because I've just heard Corey, our dealer, say £100 mm -hmm. is her best offer. Mm -hmm. The independent valuers are saying two to three hundred mm -hmm. that I believe should go to the auction mm -hmm. I'll see you at the auction and hopefully we will get a little bit more than the hundred pounds what do you feel like doing I think in circumstances I'll go to auction please yeah. I wish you the very okay. best of luck thank you where's the 15 now then 15, so it's 15, off to auction to see if the bracelet now. will dazzle the bidders now, Colin, you brought along um, a bracelet which I suppose you would call second-hand jewellery. It's not antique jewellery, it's not exactly modern, it's a few years old. Gold bangles set with 11 emeralds, there's some small diamonds in between. £100 was turned down, an offer from Corrie Jeffries. It's here in the sale room. If we're lucky and we sell, you're going out to buy some Welsh gold or items made out of Welsh gold for your two daughters. Let's keep our fingers crossed and see what we can do here. Let me bangle this and then straight in at 150, at 150. Good start, 150. 150 200 to reserve. 70, 180, 190, 200 with me on commission at 200. Commission. 200 in commission, so it's at the reserve. At 200 pounds, on commission and sold then at 200 pounds and away. Gavel's gone down at 200 pounds, take away 20 pounds commission leaves you 180. Mm -hmm. Is that going to buy you uh, anything in Welsh gold or will it just go towards that? It'll go a long way towards. OK, are you happy? Very happy, yeah. Sure? Sure. On the day, Colin's smiling, he's happy, he's got the real deal, we're all happy. 
Back in the dealer's den, David takes time out to hear about the puppet show, which has been a hit with children for over 300 years. You probably wonder what I'm doing sat here holding a figure of Mr Punch. I want to introduce you to an extraordinary lady, Jackie Codman. That's it. Um, your family, <laughs> the, the family is very interesting. They came here, they were Romanists from Hungary. That's it. They came here in the 1700s. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell me why your great-grandfather great came did. to Clandidno. Well, he was an itinerant musician and he had been travelling around, making quite a good living. But when he got to Clandidno, one of the horses died that was pulling the caravan. So the poor man couldn't go any further, okay. you see. But being a very you know, enterprising man, he thought he'd been, he'd been shown how to do Punch and Judy on his travels by an old master. And he thought, well, what can I do? And Plandidno was just being built, a very popular seaside resort. So he was seen, and it's down in our archives, that he was walking the beach and he was looking for driftwood. And really? he carved all the dolls that we use today just from driftwood off our beach. And yeah. from that time onwards, the family has continued the tradition of mm -hmm. Punch and Judy mm -hmm. and have gone around the, uh, the seaside resorts of the north Well, we're, we're basically, basically, we're always in Plandidno. So you're but, always here. But great-grandfather would go in the quieter months to other places and they would work or they used to make a living because they would do the winters as well. What I want to know is this story is a very old English story and of course was used at county fairs for hundreds of years yeah. but it's still popular today. Now in some ways it's a very violent anti-social message that's coming out. On one hand we have Mr Punch and his wife Judy, they fight with each other, Punch hits Judy and so the tale goes on until the policeman comes, they arrest him mm -hmm. and eventually um, there's other parts of the story here with, um, with the crocodile and the eating of the sausage and it's, it's an intricate tale, but there is a tale of violence here. Yeah. What surprises me, how do small children on the beach today like it? They love it. There's no change. There's absolutely no change. They scream from beginning to end. They know, they're clever enough, they know they're puppets and they know that Mr Punch is getting hit first. You have to remember that, Mr Punch is always hit first. So Mr Punch, he gets it first? Oh, he always, every character goes for Mr Punch, but he's just cleverer than them and he outwits them. In your family today, are they being used at the moment? Are the family members using the Punch and Judy yes, show at the moment? Yes, we do a full season from Easter till September. My son's doing it now, he's the fifth generation. Thank you so much for bringing in this amazing Punch and Judy show. Long live it be working here in Clandidno. Oh, and yeah. as Mr Punch would say, that's the way to do it. <laughs> the cut and thrust of the dealer's den continues with the next item on John Parker's table. Well, we've got a sword here, haven't we? We have. Fairly obviously, I can say that. Um, what's the history? How did you come by it? Uh, I came by by a friend of mine when I was a, a young apprentice in the aviation industry uh, mm -hmm. back in the 60s and he knew I was interested in memorabilia and, and things right. of that type. Yeah. I couldn't afford antiques but he said I could have it. It was in a very poor condition when I received it. It mm -hmm. was covered in rust and paint. Oh really? So I set it's about... a real restoration uh, yeah, job on a it? Yeah, restoration job. Very good yeah. I might yeah. say as well. Yeah. So I've had it over 40 years mm. now. Yeah. At first I didn't really know much about it other than I thought it was a naval sword and then I've seen it more recently over the years on the mm, internet, Yes, similar yes. models to yeah. it and it appears to me from what I can read on it and what I've found that it's an Austrian sword made in 1851 mm -hmm. and um, some of them were sold across the Atlantic for the American Civil War. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean I'm, if you pull it out, which I shall do without hopefully killing anybody. And I can see that there are marks on both sides at the top of the blade. Mm -hmm. They can't actually read them, they're quite indistinct. And this one seems to be a name. Yeah. It's sort of got Herman or something like that. And also, I noticed that very indistinctly on the scabbard, there's also a name which looks as if it's the same yeah. as the one on the blade, mm -hmm. which is nice because it means they belong together. As I'm sure you know, it's what we call a sabre. And yes. a sabre was basically for cavalry. You know, it's, it's 
it's a really nice thing, and it's a tactile thing. As you say, I think I don't think it's English. That's where it would have hung from the, the mm -hmm. belt. And anyway, what, why do you want to sell it suddenly after well, 40 years? Well, I've just moved down here to Llandudno, mm -hmm. and uh, we don't have the room to have such things on the wall or display, so I thought I'd bring it along. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a very a very interesting thing. And um, uh, the restoration, did you do that? or? Yes, I did the restoration. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was a, a young apprentice. I well, so you, you knew your art, yes. <laughs> well, I was working in yeah. metal as well at yeah. the time, yeah. So well, you've, you have done a very good job, and you haven't over-cleaned it, because it's something that we often see is that people over-restore, and it takes away so much of the value. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so, have you an idea of what it might be worth, what you'd accept for it? Well, I think I have a good idea of what I think it's, it's worth. a good it. idea. Yeah. OK, well, let's bring out the, the filthy Luca. Right. 20, 40, 60, 80. How does that look? Well, I was looking for higher than that. OK, well, how about a hundred? I've walked in at this stage, Colin, because I heard you say it's not what I had in mind. Let me tell you what the independent valuers and the auctioneers say, John. They say 80 to 120 pounds. They're both within that range. I've had a look at the cavalry sword. It's in reasonably good condition, but it's a basic standard issue type uh, yeah. sword. Mm. Remember, uh, viewers at home, you cannot really go walking around in the street with something like this. <laughs> Even the auctioneer has to have uh, a special locked room or cabinet to be able to hold edged weapons like this. It's pretty obvious they are dangerous. OK, John, £100 is on the table there. If you went to the auction, you might get that little bit more, but there's 15% commission to be deducted. I'm going to say £100 on the table now. Grab that and get off down to the pub. Believe you me, that's a good offer. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I think I'll take his advice on this occasion, and I think we've got a deal. OK, great. Thank it's you, John. nice to be in Slam Dubno. Thank you. Coming up... I know what it is. Do you know what it is? Yes. <laughs> this is not a fire alarm. Find out just what it is after the break. Where have you been? Welcome back to Dickinson's Real Deal from Plandidno. Hi, your name is? Pat. And it's straight Pat. over nice to, to Stuart to see if he likes the sound of the next item on his table. I know what it is. Do you know what it is? Yes. What can you tell me about it? Um, I bought it about 40 years ago. Did you? Um, outside a garage, and it was a big box full of junk. Well, I, I know them as klaxon horns. Yeah. Uh, although this particular one is made in New York and it's got, uh, it's called Sejic, but presumably that's just the maker's name. Yeah. Um, and they were made to go on vehicles. Mm -hmm. So, not, uh, a lot of people think they're wartime things and so on, but they were actually just a warning, like our modern day yeah. horn on cars. Yeah. This particular model is probably on a big car or a small commercial truck or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, Nice colours. Did you repaint it? Yeah. yeah. Why? Can I ask you why you bought it along today to sell it? Um, sort of having a sort of um, house tidy. You're having a downsizing yeah. or tidying Downsize, up. Downsizing, yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's, okay. uh, it's given a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm sure it has yeah. actually. It, uh, yeah. I can see it calling in the gardener and yeah. and the children from the <laughs> yeah. down the garden, down the woods, and that. Yeah. I wonder, should we have a go at it? See what it sounds yeah, sure, like. Yeah. Can I do that? Yeah. Okay. This is not a fire alarm. <laughs> Amazing sound, isn't it? <laughs> well, on that note, I'll have a go at buying it, shall I? Mm -hmm. I know exactly what I pay for them. I know exactly what I sell them for. 2040. Should I have a channel here somewhere? £50. Can you do a little bit more? £50 the price. I, I usually clean them up, paint them up, sell them 
Yeah. A little bit more than that, but right. I usually buy them at 40 or 50 pounds. Right. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. We have a deal? Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if Corrie Jeffrey is inspired by this pair of paintings. And these are your pictures? Yes, they are. Can you tell me a little bit about them? I acquired them just over six years ago. Um, after my husband passed away, I was selling his uh, railway photographs. And a gentleman came over to me and brought these two paintings to me. So anyway, he picked what he wanted and he said, uh, well, how much do you want for these photographs? I said, well, you give me the paintings and you can have the photographs. So you swapped them? I swapped you them. You swapped them? I swapped them. Well, let's have a look at them. You've got some lovely colour, the green and the mm. orange and pink and the lemon yellow sails here. And here you've got a white... So white cliffs with a, with a lighthouse or a tall building. And they look more Mediterranean to me. They could equally well be the northeastern coast, like yeah. Holland, but I, I, I feel they're more Mediterranean. And here we've got a pair of initials. Yes. What, do you, have you read the initials? Well, I can make out sort of like a P there and a H on there. They're about 80 years old, would you say? Thereabouts. Yeah, 1920s, 1930s, yeah. that kind of day. I would, I would think so too, but in lovely condition, very fresh colours. If you knew where they were and mm. who they were by, obviously that's going to affect the value. Yes. And there is every chance if you go to auction, somebody will know this. Mm. Right now, I don't know this. No, so I what don't. I'm going to do is put money on the table. Yeah. Bit blind. Okay. 20, 40. Well, I have got a figure in mind, but... It's just, and £40 pounds isn't it, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I can do a little bit better. And it is a very little bit. You've got 45 on the table. Mm. What do you think? Now, just before you say anything there, Bessie, let yeah. me tell you what the independent valuers and the auctioneers say. They say £40 pounds to £55. Pounds. Now, these aren't the greatest, finest pictures, but they are rather nice wall fillers. I do feel our independence in this particular case were a little bit on the low side. I'm going to say they're worth a little bit more, or maybe a gamble at auction. So you've got 45 on yeah. the table. Can you squeeze a little bit more out for you? Well, if I said 50, 50 on the table. And that really is my last offer. Is that a deal? That's a deal. That's a deal. That's a deal. Thank you very much Thank for you bringing them along. Now, will John be shaken or stirred by an Amiga watch? Hello, Tom. Nice to meet you. And I see we have a watch here. And interestingly, if I can see the Omega sign. Correct. And I happen to like Omegas. Um, but anyway, um, how did you come by it? I mean, it's uh, I, its original box, which is nice. I came by the, bo the watch uh, in, working in Poland in 1979. Poland? Um, yes. Really? Yeah. Tell me more. Uh, well, the, the town where I was working was called Boswarvik. And in the jeweller's shop, there were three watches. They used to say when we were working out there, if you saw something that very day, don't wait until tomorrow, buy it that day. Really? Well, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a very nice watch. I mean, it's a steel watch. It's not gold or anything like that. But uh, I see it's a Deville Dynamique, which is not one I've actually heard of. But it's got a nice sweep second hand. It's got the date, as we can see, and I suppose it must be waterproof to a certain extent. I hope so. <laughs> right. Well, it's a question of talking some money now, and uh, let's see. Pile goes down. It's 20, 40, 60, 70. How about that? Wrong colour, the last one. Wrong colour. So if I change the colour, might we be getting a bit warmer? Maybe. Let's see, let's see. Right, put that back there. 80 pounds, how about that? 
Is there, is there any more? Is there anything more? Well, I've got a soft spot for omegas. I'm going to put another 10 down, making it 90 pounds. What do you want I to do? I think I'll take a gamble and go to auction. You'll go to auction? Yes. You ever sold at auction before? No. Well, all the very best. Good luck. Thank you very I hope much. you do well. Thank you. That's a decisive move by Thomas. Time to see if his confidence pays off. Fifty. Fifty. Now, Thomas, on the dealer's day, you brought along a stainless steel gents Amiga in working order. That's correct. It's coming up now, 120 to 140 is the estimation. There is a reserve of 100 quid. Are we going to get the 100 quid plus? What do you think? Maybe. Maybe. Has Thomas done the right deal? I hope so. 60, 60 and bid, 70, 80, 80 bid, 90, 90 bid, 100, 100 bid, 100, 100 bid, 110, 120. 120. At 120 bid, front of the bid then at 120. At 120, out on the phone, guys. At 120 and sold and off at 120. 120, take away 10%. I make that 108 quid. <laughs> But we've done it. We've done it. <laughs> we've done it. <laughs> You've now cashed it in, £120 under the gavel, taking home 108 quid in cash. Are you happy? Just a job. <laughs> Very good, yeah. <laughs> you can good. tell he's happy. Just the job. That was the real deal. Coming up. If you put another 50 on, we might do a deal. Would you take another twin, Steve? No. You're quite set on what I'm you want in the mind, yes. Rory... Simon is up against a tough seller after the break. Welcome back to Dickinson's Real Deal, where the locals of Landodno have been bringing all sorts of antiques, curios and collectibles to our dealer's table today. Now it's over to Simon, who's been served up this fruity pair, which have also caught the eye of David and auctioneer Simon Bauer. Jill, you've brought in these very pretty plates. What can you tell me about them? They belong to my mother, um, and I understand that they came from a house in Halifax. My mother's sister was housekeeper there, and when things got broken, they'd say, dispose of them, so they got distributed around the family. And do you know what they are, who they're made by? And um, They're Royal Worcester. They're painted by a guy called Lockyer. Um, I've looked him up on the website, and there's a few named painters and, and he's one of them. He's one that's well known actually yes, painting fruit. That's right. So as, as you correctly say, these are made by Royal Worcester. Um, they're very, very good condition actually. I've had a closer look at them and there's just a few scratches, but basically yes. they're, they're in pristine condition still, which is nice to see. And they date from sort of around the mid-20s, 1920s to mm -hmm. 1930, something like that. Yeah. So they've got some age as well. I think they're very decorative. I think they're very nicely painted, they're in good condition, and they're actually quite saleable as well at the moment. It's something that's being collected. Mm -hmm. So we've got quite a nice item here. Good. So why are you selling them? Well, they're in a drawer in my bedroom. Um, I, don't, I haven't got room for them. My daughter doesn't want them, so we're going on holiday. So if you can raise some funds we'll towards the holiday, it, yes. this is as good yep, a way as any. Absolutely. Now, Simon, some 20th century Worcester Fruit Worcester, mm -hmm. I believe the travelling people call this real Worcester. Yeah, that's true. Highly popular with them. Well, it always is, isn't it? It always is. And it's a good subject matter as well, Very. the fruit. Uh, bright, colourful, decorative. Am I right in thinking this is doing reasonably well in the sale room? In my experience, it's, it has risen a bit, this early 20th century Worcester. It, has, it is on the up. I think for the future, these may be a nice little investment. But the most important thing is, what is our dealer Simon going to say and what is he going to put on the table? Let's see what he places down on the table. Well, I like these, so I'm going to make you a good offer for these and I hope you're okay. going to say yes. I would pay you for your two Worcester plates, Jill. 50, 100, 150, 200. Stop me if I go too far. No, I'm not stopping you, I'm not stopping you yet. <laughs> 250, 300 pounds, that's 150 pounds each for them. Mm, I think they're probably worth a bit more than that. Well, let's see what David's opinion is. OK. Well, I've got two, well, three different opinions here. The auctioneer is a bit more on the careful side. He's saying 250 to 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. 
Our independent values are saying five to seven hundred pounds. And uh, I think there's a marketplace out there. My estimation would probably be around the four hundred pounds, not the five to seven hundred pounds, but they are desirable. All you need is good competition in the sale room and they could do a lot better. But it may well be that Simon hasn't finished yet. He might want to put some more money down. Thank you. 250. Simon Schneider is making an offer for a pair of Worcester plates. He's up to 300 pounds, but the seller wants more. I do like them, as I've already said, and I would like to buy them, so I'm quite happy to put down another 50, 100, making a total of 400 pounds. Hmm. What I will say before you say anything, Jill, is yep. for you to actually end up with 400 pounds in an auction, they've got to sell for almost 500 for you to end up with that. I think there. the auctioneer's value is probably quite low. If you put another 50 on, we might do a deal. Would you take another 20? No. You're quite set on what I'm you quite want, set on that, you? yes. Now, Simon obviously has got a marketplace for this because he's put £400 in cash down on the table. I think that's about where it should be. I need to get in there and tell our seller that's a pretty good offer. So what we got? You got one, two, two three, three four. four. So you want four fifty? Make for it four fifty, and they're yours. I'm going to take David's advice. So for the other fifty <laughs> down, David. I well, think I know what he's going to I've say. heard what you've asked for. Simon is probably prepared to put another fifty pounds mm. down. Now, I'm listening to the auctioneer of the room that these will go to yes. because no one will know that room better than him. Mm. He is a bit conservative, and he's saying. 250 to 300 pounds. Now we have independent values are saying for sure in the sale rooms that they attend they are five to seven. Already you have 400 pounds, you've asked for a little bit more, so on the day that is for sure. In my opinion that's a good offer. Thank you. We all know where this is going then, Jill. I'm going to put down another £50. That makes a total of £950, which is £450 in total for your two Worcester plates. Is that a deal? That's a deal. Thank you very much for coming Thank in today, and I hope you have a lovely holiday. I will. Thank you. Thank you. The decision. Now it's time to find out how all our dealers fared on the day. <laughs> Stuart is having the claps and restored before selling it. John has yet to cut a deal on the sword. Corrie broke even on the watercolours, selling them for £50. Simon scrapped the gold brooch for £150 and was relieved to part with a pair of Worcester plates for £500. 